hello and warm welcome to all to this Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training monthly virtual diplomatic lunch discussion. For any who may not know me, I'm Susan Johnson, the president of ADST. And as a foreign service officer, I spent a good part of my career at what I like to call the crossroads between the State Department and USAID. And I'm especially pleased, therefore, to have John Norris and Jim Beaver with us today for this particular discussion. ADST's mission is to strengthen public appreciation for American diplomacy and to enrich professional knowledge about it. We do this by capturing, preserving, and sharing experiences of American diplomats. This series features policy experts and authors who contribute to our work via their books and discussions like today's. We invite you to learn more about ADST to support our work to produce and share a modern American diplomatic and development oral history and to sign up to record your own oral history at ADST.org. Now, the host moderator of our virtual diplomatic lunch series, FSO Mark Rincon, who is ADST's Director of Communications and Outreach, is going to go over some practical details about the program and introduce today's guest moderator, Jim Beaver, who will then introduce John Norris. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. We appreciate you taking the time to be here. And uh, we're especially pleased to have uh, Jim Beaver with us. He's an ADST board member and a retired USA, USAID Foreign Service officer as well. So he has a lot of experience and fits right in with our discussion. And he'll serve as our moderator and he'll get us started as we discuss uh, The Enduring Struggle, uh, the, the new book by John Norris, who will touch on the history of the USAID and America's uneasy uh, transformation of, of the world. So Jim, uh, it's our pleasure to have you. I'll turn it over to you as well uh, to get us started. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, those of you who are in this time zone. And um, thank you very much, Mark. And special thanks to you, Susan Johnson, president of ADST, uh, and also to your and the board's and your staff's abiding continued interest and support for those of us who have worked in the U.S. Foreign Assistance Program over our careers as an important element of U.S. foreign policy. I, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, John Norris. Uh, John, welcome to, for joining us today and um, to celebrate the very recent uh, publication of your book. Uh, I will hold it up here. Um, and uh, uh, which is published by uh, Ro Roman and Littlefield and is available now for uh, professionals and others to order online. Um, it's entitled The Enduring Struggle, The History of USAID and America's Uneasy Transformation of the World. Um, I want to also, before we get into some discussions with you, John, I'd like to also acknowledge thanks to the USAID Alumni Association, uh, of which I'm also privileged to be elected board member, um, and to USAID's alumni's 1,200 members, uh, to those in particular who helped to support and contribute to the thinking originally for the need for a book like this, um, going back to as early, I'm told, as 2015, um, and then the mobilization which began around 2017, including bringing you on board, John, um, to uh, do the research and to write this independently as you saw fit and as you saw the cards call. In particular, I would like to thank a few of our former administrators who contributed to the support of this project, as well as to over 150 members of the Alumni Association, who also contributed to make sure that we could bring this book uh, to fruition. Um, and finally, Alex Shackow, former Assistant Administrator of AID for Policy, Carol Peasley, former 
senior foreign service officer with AID and former counselor to the administrator. Ambassador Jim Michael, also senior foreign service officer and former counselor to the administrator and Dan Rundy, former director for uh, the Global Development Alliance and now of course at Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS. For your abiding support, the four of you as being the team to support uh, John's efforts and the Alumni Association's efforts for this book. But in the end, the book is 100% independently written by John. Um, let me tell you a moment about John. You've probably seen a little bit of his background on the announcement, but he's currently with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So he is uh, dialing into this meeting from uh, Seattle. Um, He's been a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He's been executive director of the Enough Project. He was invited to serve on President Obama's Global Development Council in 2014. He was chief of political affairs at the UN Mission in Nepal, chief of staff in Washington, DC for the International Crisis Group, director of communications for Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot, during President Clinton's time and field disaster expert and a speechwriter for USAID. So he knows how to communicate the importance of foreign assistance to the American people. He's also an accomplished author, written three prior books, one of which, the biography of, journal, of journalist Mary McGrory, the first queen of journalism, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. I'd like to say especially to you, John, I noticed your acknowledgments and your dedications in the book and ranging from your research assistant and thought, um, thought, thought uh, partner, as you described her, Carolyn Kenny, all the way to, quote, the people of USAID past and present who work under the most demanding conditions, usually with little fanfare, and have made this world a better place, unquote. So thank you for those dedications. Um, we've gotten uh, excellent acknowledgements on your book from Peter McPherson who said, I wish I had this book when I was running AID. And Henrietta Four who said, this book is a must read for anyone who cares about development and America's place in the world. And then the Center for Global Development, I think yesterday said this book is bullish on the importance of US foreign assistance to our country. And finally, some of my most respected constructive critics within USAID who stunned me by basically uh, having a great deal of difficulty finding things to criticize about your work. Um, they called The Enduring Struggle a book that far outstrips in quality and readability any previous history of USAID ever seen. And another one who said, quote, John Norris knows how to tell a story well, unquote. With that, welcome, John. Thank you, Jim. I will, uh, we'll try to do a little fireside chat kind of thing here for a little bit and then um, give you the chance to share other ahas that we may not cover. Um, and, uh, but let me start out with um, something you wrote at, near the beginning of the book and then went back to a number of times during the book where you went to the beginnings of USAID as we knew it as an agency, um, as it was announced in the first year of President John F. Kennedy's administration. And in his inaugural address, he challenged American people to join a shared struggle against quote, tyranny, disease, and war itself, unquote. And then you continue to say, AIDS history over 60 years is a story not only of that long, uneven struggle, but of an abiding reflection of ourselves as Americans. So can you start off here maybe by describing what is it about this effort that you concluded the title should be the enduring struggle. 
Sure. I mean, uh, well, first, I want to start by also thanking, uh, uh, echoing your uh, thanks of the Alumni Association and those who, uh, the steering committee that I work with, but also ADST itself, uh, the oral histories that were pulled together by ADST in conjunction with oral histories that were also done uh, by the Kennedy and Johnson administrations after they left office, uh, were an enormous resource uh, to have uh, people speaking about their work in contemporaneous uh, recollections uh, and really being able to put together uh, how people saw their work on the ground from multiple points of view from people involved and people being fairly uh, reasonably unvarnished in their recollections was just, um, I think, gave the material uh, an immediacy and a, a humanism that it otherwise would have lacked. So, you know, I uh, am probably uh, one of a relative minority of people who've read every single ADST oral history uh, on the development side and a bunch on the foreign policy of, on the state side as well. Um, so kudos to you and I hope that you're able to kind of keep up the important work. You know, the enduring struggle uh, for me, uh, I think, is a reflection of the work because it is so often a mixed bag that we have uh, really important successes. Uh, we have things that have really shaped the face of the world uh, from eradicating smallpox, from the Green Revolution, oral rehydration therapy, the long-term developments of the Asian tigers and Latin America uh, and work in Africa uh, with things that have not worked very well, that obviously Vietnam was a, a scarring event for aid as an institution, for public perceptions of foreign aid, uh, and other efforts in uh, big conflict settings haven't worked particularly well. Uh, efforts like Egypt, well, obviously having uh, accomplished a great deal, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that really stood out was the, the shared frustration among those who've worked in Cairo. And, you know, and we also uh, kind of go back and forth as a nation uh, that we like to beat up on foreign aid, but we see it as an important uh, tool. We see it as the right thing to do, but we perpetually worry that we're being taken advantage of. Uh, we uh, at times put in place very effective ways to go about the business of aid. And other times we clutter it up uh, in areas like food aid and by American restrictions and things that uh, are playing to a domestic audience. So it's a, it's a very complicated legacy. And, you know, and part of that was part of the reason why I was really interested in writing the book was because uh, the pieces on AID, and I, I'd been through a lot, but even before this exercise, as you said, somebody had been a speechwriter at the agency, um, you know, they tend to veer between the promotional and ad hominem attacks with not a lot in between. Uh, and I thought it was something that deserved a fairer, more balanced treatment because it is such an interesting, important history. Well, uh, speaking of audience, um, I'm curious if you could share with us what was going through your mind as you took this assignment um, as to whom you were writing this book for, who in your mind as you wrote it was the audience? Was it policymakers in our executive branch? Was it uh, practitioners uh, in the field, uh, congressional staffers, uh, special interests um, for this kind of foreign aid or that kind of aid, presidential advisors, students aspiring to careers in foreign affairs? Can you share with us what, what was going through your mind as you wrote this and how that may have evolved? Yeah, you know, honestly, I don't, uh, um, this is a horrible thing for a writer to say, but, you know, I don't think about my audience a great deal as I'm actually in the process of writing. Um, it's a long, somewhat solitary journey from page one to um, being able to turn in galley proofs. Uh, you know, and I kind of, in some ways, kind of write for myself that this is something of a, a busman's holiday, that I've got a full-time job, I've got three kids and a bunch of other obligations, and uh, I've um, managed to kind of write books and, and figure out how to do that on top of things. Uh, but for me, writing has always been really important to make it so that it is both 
credible to professionals, but accessible to people who may not know the topic very well. Uh, and you should be able to uh, read material and uh, it should be compelling to both those audiences. I am a um, great, uh, I have a great dislike for acronyms, uh, which as you imagine, taking on a history of AID, but I had a um, veritable uh, um, gold mine of acronyms with which to work. Uh, there's very few in the book. Uh, you know, I, I think it's those things that kind of clutter up how we talk about things and how we communicate things. Um, but obviously, I think there's value for the book uh, in for those who care about uh, contemporary American history, people who like foreign policy, people who are interested in the specific countries or specific sectors, uh, development professionals, students. Um, yeah, and you know, and I think the other thing about having such an enormous well of source material of 60 years, uh, over 115 different countries to work with uh, and literally uh, piles of paper that I could stack to the ceiling to choose from. It didn't allow me to pull out what I thought were the more compelling and illustrative examples. Uh, you know, and uh, there are parts of the history that just make really good copy. Um, you know, Lyndon Johnson is one of those people who cannot help himself but offer just, you know, language and a style of speaking that just is fantastic um, for all writers, biographers, historians to, to follow. Um, and, you know, and obviously it's impossible to do justice to every sector and every country in which AID has worked during that period. Um, so I tried to be fairly balanced and judicious in highlighting those things that I really thought stood out and were most significant in terms of both success or failures or lessons to be learned. Well, one of the things I enjoyed about reading the book was how you interspersed presidential um, documents from presidential libraries and so on, of uh, what uh, Lyndon Johnson or Kennedy or Nixon or others were thinking with what rank and file USAID Foreign Service officers were doing and thinking contemporaneously in the field at those times. And uh, I see, I thought I saw Terry Myers on here on the screen at one point here this morning. Yes. And uh, he's simply one example of many that, uh, that you were able to pick up in, uh, your, in the book and used as an example of the oral histories uh, that other authors used in case of Terry Myers, for example, for the blood telegram um, about uh, the creation of Bangladesh and the war in Pakistan and India. Um, can you share with us also another element of the title of your book, America's Uneasy Transformation of the World? What did you have in mind as, you, as that element landed on the title of this book? You know, it goes to what I think has been the fundamental struggle in terms of how uh, different presidents in particular have seen, and secretaries of state, and frankly, aid administrators have seen the role of development assistance. Uh, you know, and I think it was very important that, uh, in my mind, that Kennedy in creating AID saw development in its own right as a really important purpose. Um, and in contrast, there's been a steady strain of uh, uh, senior officials who, and parts of the public that have seen aid through a much more instrumental lens, that it's there to fight communism, it's there to fight terrorism, it's there to win us votes at the friendly votes of the UN, uh, it's there to uh, um, tip the scales in terms of regional competition. You know, and I think if you look at the history, um, not only does that not make a lot of strategic sense, it's not very effective towards that end. Uh, thinking that um, the relatively modest amounts of development assistance that we have to offer in terms of a country's entire economy uh, is going to make them align with our strategic objectives just uh, doesn't always make a lot of sense. But I think the, the long-term bet uh, that expanding the community of free market democracies that are able to be reasonably prosperous and care for their people and build up their human capital uh, is naturally aligned with our long-term interests. I've always seen that as the core purpose of development, and I think that's always motivated my own involvement in the field. Um, and, you know, we've kind of 
pinged around between those. So uh, the way in which we're trying to transform the world uh, has, you know, been at odds with itself. Uh, you know, and I think that uh, many of those things, even those things that we have done well and set out to do, you know, that we wanted very clearly, and, you know, Jim Michael can speak to this quite well. One of the cornerstone efforts of the USAID program was to expand the number of donors. Uh, and we've done that fantastically well. Not only uh, all the former Marshall Plan recipients, but uh, lots and lots of those countries that were important aid recipients in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, are now part of the donor community and growingly influential. As a consequence, we are a much smaller voice so that we don't have an uncontested playing field uh, in terms of influence, in terms of development. Um, you know, and I see that as a happy problem to have, um, but I don't think that uh, necessarily as we're living through it in a day-to-day -day way that um, policymakers necessarily wake up and think this is a happy problem to have. Um, so yes, it, it uh, it has been an uneasy struggle uh, for us and a transformation that um, I think has made enormous progress uh, since the 1960s. And I think lots of people probably take that for granted because we tend to focus on negative headlines. Um, but obviously, there's still a long ways to go. So one of the struggles within uh, the professional core of USAID has often been uh, the, the battle for resources, uh, both people and money, and frankly, attention from the right parts of the US government interagency. So I found as I was reading the book a number of times where you said, quote, uh, bigger has often not meant better for USAID. I, it, it caused some cognitive dissonance in my brain. I had to think through what you were trying to get at. Could you share with people what you meant by that? Um, because it, it keeps popping up in your, your own ahas in this book. Yeah, so, you know, I think if you look historically at those moments where um, the floodgates of resources were opened for the agency, um, Vietnam was uh, an instant, you know, there was a whole Vietnam Bureau that uh, um, spending in Vietnam at one point outpaced all of the spending in Africa. Uh, it, it was, um, there were more staff in Vietnam than anywhere else in the world. Uh, Egypt was a huge program. Iraq was a huge program. Afghanistan was a program. You know, and it goes to that um, AID always wants to be on the radar and wants attention from the government uh, until it has it often and it is often a mixed blessing you know it's kind of the the dog chasing the car what are you going to do when you catch it uh, because that uh, attention often comes with a bunch of really bad development decisions around it uh, that that money is pouring in because country x or y has risen up on the strategic radar not because we suddenly care deeply about its development um, so again and again we've seen decisions that uh where there's a lot of emphasis, you know, and Andrew Natsios, um, who oh, I um, know all of you speak with on a fairly regular basis, you know, he speaks very compellingly about uh, having to go to White House meetings on Afghanistan and Iraq, where all they want to talk about was the burn rate. Uh, how quick are you spending your money? Uh, which you would think would be a great problem to have, but it's not when uh, you don't have the time to put in place those fundamentals of a good development program. Uh, if you're building hospitals without asking if there was a clinic there before, if there's nurses there to staff it, how costs will be recovered over the long term, um, what type of care will be offered, or if there's schools being built, are there teachers? Um, so again and again, in those moments where uh, aid and the aid program have really been pushed into high profile national security priorities. There's been lots of money, um, but not always uh, in a very effective way. So um, before we open up for questions here in a few minutes, I'd like to ask you basically three questions. Um, if uh, the president and the vice president and the secretary of state and the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of Treasury, and the Secretary of Agriculture, and the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the Administrator of AID were on this video today. Um, what counsel would you want to give them um, about the role of USAID and US foreign assistance for the duration of this term of this administration? 
you know, the I walked away from this work, and you know, it's probably evident in the text. With um, I'm a huge fan of participant, what was called participant training. Uh, I think investing in the long-term capacity building of our partners on the ground in developing countries is the smartest bet in terms of development. I think it has the highest rates of return. Um, you know, and I think that we often uh, um, conflate or confuse short-term training. Uh, we pour lots of money into short-term programs or send people away for a week or two or train them to be better fit to deal with um, filling out RFPs or, you know, our needs. Uh, and I think real long-term capacity building is investing in people, uh, giving them a generalist education, um, both on development principles, on budgeting, on management, helping them develop a worldview. And I think if you look back historically, uh, those investments paid enormous dividends. And if you look at the Taiwan, Korea, Costa Rica, other experiences um, in Latin America uh, in a more complicated uh, case. You know, those were people who had long-term training in the U.S. or at regional uh, universities and came back and ultimately led their country. And their investments that often lie fallow for considerable periods of time. Um, and we have to be patient. And those investments really paid off when windows for reform opened. You know, and those windows are episodic and you can't really predict when the moment is gonna be right for reform in country X or Y, but making sure that there is in place a well-trained, educated cadre who really cares about development and has the skills to manage and to be a very sophisticated interlocutor for us. Uh, and push back on things where they disagree with us and to hammer out compromise, uh, I think is the, the best investment in development. And I think sadly, it's one that we've um, gotten a bit away from for a, a bunch of very complicated reasons. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised at what you just said because one of my notes to myself in preparing for today was, I hope he mentions participant training because you mentioned it in the book and for many of my colleagues, probably that are on this call, we would agree with you. And I was hoping one of the answers to your this question was would be to emphasize that maybe we need a new name for it. Um, so my second question, same sort of thing. If the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the Minority Leader of the House and the majority and minority leaders of the Senate and the chairpersons and ranking members of our four most important committees of appropriations and authorizations were on this video today. What would you tell them as leaders of the legislative branch? Yeah, for me, I think that, and this is deeply shaped by my experience um, in the field, that the best thing we can do and say to uh, leaders in Congress about foreign aid is, uh, is to get them on a plane is to get them on the ground in the developing world, is to have them see these programs up close. Talking about these things in Washington is useful. Uh, having people from their own districts or their own states talk to them is even more useful. Uh, but I look at the history of congressional involvement in the aid program and every single champion uh, of note really formed their view and opinion uh, based on field experience and having seen these programs up close. You know, Pat Leahy cares about landmines because he traveled around in Cambodia. Nita Lowy carried about, cares about education um, because, you know, she had traveled in the developing world. Every staffer, every member, uh, you know, nobody walks out of a refugee camp or a school in the developing world and says, wow, we are doing way too much. You know, they come back and think, how can we do it better? How can we do it differently? How can we do more of it? Uh, and I think that the stuff that the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, the One Campaign, uh, others have done to get people out there on staff DELs, CODELs, um, there's just simply no substitute for. So my third and last question before we open up to the floor, um, relates to something you said in your conclusions. And I see George Ingram is on this video that, today. And uh, uh, George, I think it was you who said, uh, this is the most concise, brilliant set of conclusions of a book of this nature you've ever seen. And you would commend 
the, the, those six pages of conclusions as a primer to anybody uh, coming into a, a responsibility for foreign assistance, whether political or career. And in those conclusions, you said, John, you had some insights to the role of U.S. ambassadors. Uh, you said something like, um, instead of us only thinking of aid as a tool for diplomacy, we need to turn this around and think of diplomacy as a critical tool for development. Um, can you elaborate some on what you're thinking and if we had 100 current U.S. ambassadors here, if this was an ambassadorial train, uh, course um, for new ambassadors, what would you be advising them about U.S. foreign assistance and, and uh, AID? Yeah, I would, I would urge them to not just think about uh, the assistance program as a way to meet your proximate needs. Um, signing ceremonies are terrific, uh, and uh, using the aid program to help curry influence with the foreign ministry or uh, the president or prime minister uh, is an interesting, useful, short-term game. Uh, but if you really want to transform the place you are working, if you want to be seen as uh, a U.S. ambassador that change the trajectory of a country that you're working in, you know, work with the aid program to figure out those fundamental structural changes and uh, that can be made in this country to make it self-sustaining, to make it successful, uh, to bring in those people who've been systematically excluded from the economic, social, and political life of the country, to push through those economic reforms that will make it a more vital, vibrant partner over the long term, uh, and to really work in conjunction to um, use both carrot and stick along with your aid partners to help um, really solidify a partnership with a developing country in a way that really sets it on good footing for the long term. And that's how real ambassador or legacies are built. Thanks, John. Um, thanks for filling that out. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do at this point is open up for discussions, for uh, questions. Uh, people can go to the reaction section and find the hand raising that helps us or chats. Uh, I see Susan Johnson there mm -hmm. as the first one that caught my eye. Go ahead, Susan. Well, thank you, and, and thank you both. Uh, um, I think this, this book's fascinating, and I really look forward to reading it. I just kind of flipped through it when I got a copy. Um, I want to follow up, uh, uh, Jim, on the question that you just posed, and John, on your response, because my question had to do with the relationship between foreign assistance and diplomacy and it, on, on various levels, you know, what's the appropriate form for that relationship in terms of the policy making level, the implementation of both level and the institutional relationships or structures that might serve us um, best. Uh, I know there's been an ongoing debate, you know, should aid be uh, absorbed into state? Should they be separate? And how do they coordinate? And I've lived with both. And I'm just wondering if we sometimes um, m multiply our mistakes or the con consequences of them because our institutional structure is, is <laughs> not really conducive to the best outcomes. But anyway, I wonder if you could comment on that relationship and what is the appropriate balance between the two? I mean, obviously development you can cast as long-term, but you could also say a goal of our foreign policy and diplomacy should be you know, the long-term development. And how do you balance that? And how do you get that to happen with the right institutional relationships and structures? Yeah, you know, I think in some ways, you know, the I think the, the kind of continual turf battle between state and aid over the years has taken up so much time and energy and bandwidth and paper. Mm. Uh, God, the reams of paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the trees that have died in the struggle. That's terrible. Um, you know, so I think in some ways it's been a distraction. But, you know, I think the other kind of more important thing is that it all has to be united around a vision of our relationship with a country and where we see it going. Um, you know, I think 
South Korea is a really interesting example. Um, it was clear that we would not be able to offer aid levels at the, the same one that uh, we'd had in place over the years. And President Kennedy sent a very clear message that, that you know, this wasn't a blank check that was going to be open in perpetuity and that there needed to be real change. Um, and there was a change in administration in South Korea that um, was suddenly much more reform minded. Uh, you know, and there was enormous work done by the aid team on the ground, but also by the state folks on the ground uh, in very intensive dialogue with the government to nurture those changes. Um, you know, so for me, that's an example of where maybe the diplomacy was over-indexed on trying to achieve some of those development objectives in the relatively short term. But the long-term diplomatic benefits of having Korea um, emerge from what, you know, folks had called a basket case to one of the most dynamic uh, economies in the region. You know, they've maintained um, themselves as a key strategic partner, have really been there for the United States again and again over the years, uh, a really important trading partner. Uh, so, you know, I think the benefits are there, but uh, you have to begin with a smart, real analysis at the the country level of what you're trying to achieve and understanding that ecosystem. You know, and I feel like a lot of times the US government really struggles to put together the, the military side, the aid side, the um, diplomatic side into a coherent vision. Uh, and without all three of those legs kind of working together uh, under some clear chapeau, um, one of those legs is probably gonna fall down and drag the other two with them. Thank you. Uh Thanks, Susan, and thanks, John. I've, I've got a couple questions coming in here. Um, the first one is uh, from Mike Crosswell and also Carol Peasley, and I'll, I'll kind of merge them and then we'll go to George Ingram. Um, so Mike basically says, uh, Jim, can you, give, uh, can you give John a chance to volunteer some of his own reflections? I had a note to myself here asking for his ahas at the end, but we can do it now. And Carol uh, basically said similar, during your research and your analysis, were you surprised by any of the findings? Um, and as you proceeded, did that change your mind on any historical perspectives or the roles of certain individuals that, that feature in your book? Yeah, so to take the second first, um, you know, new directions and kind of that period in the 70s, um, you know, that it, I've kind of gotten used to and kind of, as it were, grown up professionally with a highly sectoral approach to the aid program. Um, you know, and for me, I've got a lot of disquiet with uh, the kind of grand bargain that kept the aid program alive in the early 70s, you know, that the, the push towards integrated rural development, uh, it, and it felt like kind of almost the atomization of the aid program, that I feel like we lost a good deal of that strategic vision. Um, you know, and there was a hope that the, this the kind of work of guiding macroeconomic policy would be done by the World Bank and the IMF and the, um, the international financial institutions. And, but, you know, I, I think that was a mistake in some ways because, you know, it wasn't until the late 80s and into the 90s and even somewhat reluctantly today that those institutions are willing to talk about the politics of a place. Uh, you know, and I don't think you've got um, successful economies without understanding how the politics work in a place. Um, so I think that effort to seed the, um, to give away that ground of looking at macro reforms and how they all fit together, I think was a tremendous loss for the agency. Um, and I think that um, the White House from that point on became much less interested in looking at kind of a strategic vision for how you develop a country's economy. You know, and we saw some of it emerge with um, the establishment of the MCC uh, and other institutions later on. I think there was something of a course correction later. Um, but, you know, I think that's um, also a very difficult moment because there was so much disquiet with the aid program as a result of Vietnam and the critiques that really came out in the 60s, some of which were valid and some which weren't. Uh, you know, some of those compromises were also required to keep the aid program alive. So, you know, I, I think that was an era that um, 
did a lot in kind of refreshing and evolving my thinking about it. And it's one where I'm sure there's very, very rich debates um, among the folks on, on this call today. You know, in terms of my own reflections, and Mike, it's nice to hear from you. And it was um, great to kind of go back and look at um, some of the work that you produced um, when we were both at the agency in terms of the economic record uh, of the aid program and what it's done and, and not achieved. Uh, and, you know, um, I share my reflections over a couple hundred pages, so I feel like I've always got uh, um, that I had the, the speaker for a, a good good chance uh, and good period of time. You know, I think obviously the, the part that uh, I think is really important today is, you know, we have an agency that has bogged itself down and, you know, and Brian Atwood and Ignacio is kind of the revenge of the, the counter bureaucracy. Um, you know, it's very hard for AID to be nimble, um, you know, as somebody who's been um, outside of aid, particularly in a lot of countries in conflict and fragile states, you know, that the U.S. government is not a place you go if you're looking for nimble funding for anything other than most immediate life-saving humanitarian assistance. Um, and, you know, and the fact that um, Norway and Sweden and the Danes can figure out how to spend 10, 20, $50,000 quickly, um, you know, because often in those kind of settings, particularly, um, it can make a real difference. Uh, and uh, aid has become uh, something of a behemoth that is big, slow, uh, and dominated by health and humanitarian assistance. Um, you know, and I understand the reality of how it's gotten to that state, um, but I do think it's somewhat problematic. Okay, so um, thanks for those uh reflections. I'm sure we'll get more as we go along here. George Ingram, over to you, please. Thanks, Jim. And like you, I'm going to ask for John's advice from having gone through the history of USAID. 30 years ago, I sat down and actually read the Foreign Assistance Act and concluded that there were 33 objectives and over 75 priorities in the act. And various of, of us over the years have been calling for AID to narrow its objectives. Um, but I'm also guilty now with other people on the outside of pushing a new priority on the administration in the digital field. And the administration is trying to figure out what it wants to do for initiative in digital. What's your advice to us, who those of us who keep pushing new priorities on the agency and what should we, we be cautious about? Well, you know, digital is one of those priorities that I think should be pushed on. Um, you know, I think there's lots of outside groups that are guilty of looking at did their kind of pet cat digital issue in isolation of, you know, uh, let's figure out digital health payments or um, support for the poor or um, delivery, you know, and I think countries are really struggling with how it all fits together, uh, who's going to pay for it, what the return on investment is, and how these systems really work together. Uh, and I take think taking a systems approach is, is really, really important. Uh, digital ID, how all these pieces fit together. Um, you know, that's the way the world's going. Um, you know, I think that um, one of my experiences from kind of working on, you know, I was John Podesta Sherpa when he was working on the UN high level panel uh, that uh, essentially did the first draft of the SDGs, you know, and we did over a hundred different consultations with outside groups, sectoral groups, you know, and one of the things that after about 20 of these that I began insisting was that uh, any outside group that wanted to meet had to bring a couple others outside groups along with it. Uh, you know, and for me, I think that's a good barometer of the efficacy of what you're trying to push. That if you can bring three education coalitions or four different digital groups along with you, it, you know, it's a probably a pretty good set of priorities. And there's probably real utility in the agency being able to engage in a dialogue with that umbrella group of outside folks on the outside. If it's something that's just developed in isolation by a single group, um, you know, then that's, I think, contributing to kind of part of the problem of how do we manage all these disparate pieces and um, everybody wants to do these different things. You know, and I'm also, as you know, George, you know, I've long been a fan of the agency 
doing more in fewer places. Uh, I think that we're uh, spread out over God's green acre and I understand why that happens and the pressure from congressional staff and from the White House and from ambassadors and uh, the process. Um, but I, you know, I think that having dribs and drabs of money in countries is a nice thing, but uh, I would really like to see us bet more heavily on those places that we think are really ripe for transformation. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, George, for your question. Um, I uh, see a question here from Jason Singer, which I'll just try to summarize, and then we'll go see Jan, Jan Bennett. Um, so uh, Jason's question basically is, what are your thoughts on the structure and composition of USAID with regards to its workforce, its professionals, both at headquarters and overseas? Uh, and because we have a wide range of such people, from foreign service officers to civil service and US PSCs and foreign service nationals and foreign service limited and PASA employees and so on. Compared to state, the foreign service at USAID is small and does not manage the agency DC operations um, as much, uh, nor the personnel or management that actually have to flow out to the missions. Any observations on that? Yeah, it's a complicated topic um, and it's kind of a, a rat's nest to try to um, tinker with in lots of ways um, because there's, it's just, um, it's embedded in lots of different ways. I personally think that more diverse composition of the workforce at aid uh, is a benefit, um, you know, and I think it allows for greater flexibility of cultural viewpoints, um, you know, and not just viewing kind of the cultures in which we work, but I mean cultures within the agency. Um, you know, the, um, the fact that um, the humanitarian relief folks um, are mostly contractors uh, and kind of view their work in a different way than kind of the long-term development people, uh, I think is both helpful and necessary in lots of ways, you know, that they, um, I remember you know, when I was first starting at the agency, how different the, the vibe was between those respective teams. Um, you know, I went to the first uh, off to Christmas party and they were using body bags to hold the ice for drinks, um, you know, and that is a, a different culture. And they're, they, ac they actually make fantastic um, ice coolers. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, and I get that. So, you know, and I think that the ability to kind of shift between shorter term, longer term needs, uh, people who see this as a full-time career and will uh, be in this game for 30 years versus people who will be in it for um, five years, 10 years. Um, you know, and I think there's lots of challenges in the um, in state's foreign service structure. Um, and I think that it has been somewhat slow to change with time. I think it's made some important progress, but um, I think an injection of um, some different approaches would be, would be useful and make it less rigid. But I also understand that a very, a diverse workforce composition and aid is not the easiest to manage. So you, so you would actually uh, hold up our uh, varied um, approach to uh, professional personnel as a model for other foreign affairs departments and agencies to think about. Yeah, a model might be a bit strong, but, you know, I think it has evolved in response to genuine need. Um, you know, is it as well managed um, in responding to those genuine needs as possible? You know, that's a question where I think all of you have um, opinions that are probably um, every bit as if not more sophisticated than my own. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move to Ms. Bennett. Uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you, John, for uh, speaking to us today. Um, I'm curious. So, um, I used to be a foreign service officer um, as well. So um, I'm curious as to your background, you've worked at USAID, you've worked at the UN, you've worked uh, now for a nonprofit. So, you know, a lot of the activities of these different organizations are kind of uh, uh, duplicative. You know, you're all doing the same thing, right? Um, so I was wondering how, you know, how you see um, aid still has any relevance today. I mean, the UN has UNDP, for example, you know, um, the, the, the Gates Foundation is, is, is very well funded, you know, and, you know, what, 
how would you justify the continuing relevance and, and mandate of aid in this, yeah. in this period yeah. of time? You know, I Thank think you. aid still has a, a disproportionately important voice. I mean, in a good way. Um, you know, it still punches above its weight in terms of influence. Um, people care what the United States has to say. Um, it's a leader, uh, certainly within the, the donor community. Um, you know, and it's really important uh, in a way that is both positive and negative sometimes uh, for aid to get its analysis uh, right on the ground because um, aid tends to have more of a field presence uh, than other countries. Lots of times you've got a bunch of other donors operating, but they don't have a very extensive field presence. Or you've got uh, somebody like the UN that's uh, more reluctant to wade into some of the politics around uh, that surround development issues. Um, so, you know, I think that there is that real leadership role, um, you know, and I've seen it cut both ways. I've seen AID programs in countries that are um, much more effective because you've got a strong ambassador and people understand what the vision is and where the country is going. Yeah, and I'm, frankly, I've worked in places where the aid program was a hot mess because you had an ambassador that just got the politics of the place wrong and the diplomacy wrong or was pushing something um, that just was not kind of on the right side of history. Um, so, you know, I think it is still really, really important, um, you know, and I think that it's also, it can really be a galvanizing force. And when you see the U.S. lead on these issues, um, it makes a real difference, you know, that <clears throat> it was, I think, U.S. leadership that helped the SDGs get across the line, uh, U.S. push for domestic resource mobilization, the U.S. and the power it can unleash with its um, uh, interagency process really still is one of the most important players in, in the game. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim Meenan asks a question here of, uh, of you, John, but also of uh, Susan as president of the ADST and former president of AFSA. Um, just what are the plans for bringing the highlights of this book um, to the attention of key congressional members and actually some of their key staff and clerks since they really only need a couple of key pages to draw their attention or our most powerful anecdotes or, or uh, elements of your analysis. Um, well, please to you, John, and then Susan. Yeah, I'll let Susan speak to it as well. You know, I am happy, I'm delighted for people to kind of use lessons from this um, in ways that they think are, are most effective with um, members of the administration, with um, congressional staffers, with the public. Um, don't ever worry that I will have a copyright beef because you've taken a couple pages and um, pulled out key talking points uh, um, that have been shared. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I uh, should reach out to USGLC uh, and see if they would be interested in doing something along these lines and conversation with uh, congressional staffers. Um, you know, and I think that on balance, I was a uh, reasonably fair to um, what is also a mixed uh, record in terms of legislative influence on the program over time. But, uh, Susan, I'll kick back to you. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the question. I mean, we, uh, we are pleased and we would love to do whatever we can to support sort of the marketing of the book and you know, any ideas or subsections of it. Um, whether that is just to get people to buy the book or whether it's to engage them on uh, discussion and um, debate about different ideas. We don't get into the business of advocating particular policy conclusions one way or the other. We're more on the process side and on being a platform for helping people um, inform themselves and helping bring together a mix of people who may be the implementers, the policymakers, the congressional folk, you know. So we're, we're very happy to do that. But um, here anyway, we don't have at ADST, we don't have either the bandwidth or a portion of the mandate, which gets us into advocacy of a particular set of conclusions, whether they be uh, in foreign policy or assistance policy or, or anything else. 
But if other people have ideas on something that we might be doing, that we might offer a platform for or a forum for, then we're very happy to entertain those ideas. Sorry for my cat. She can't stay away from the Zoom <laughs> That's meeting. All right. We have equity here. I heard a dog barking in the background. Um, so um, let's see, Terry Myers. Um, uh, I'll just read part of it. Uh, given the nature of challenges today from pandemics to climate change, uh, you say it has a critical role in the interagency, especially with administrator power now in office and her experience and influence. Uh, is this a bit of the dog catching the car problem you talked about earlier? Uh, how can you say be more effective player in the interagency? And of course, she now has for, I think the first time in the history of the agency, a seat on the National Security Council of this president. So uh, over to you, John. Yeah, you know, I think that one of the challenges for aid in the interagency process is, you know, I think they're best served, uh, the agency's best served when it approaches it like improv. Um, you know, I think there's a tendency for the agency to kind of get called into these high level meetings and kind of come back with all the reasons why something is a bad idea. Um, and, you know, and which is understandable based on experience, based on good development practice. And I think it's better served when it's able to kind of as an improv, you know, wow. it's, you're never supposed to respond to somebody with no, you're supposed to respond with and, uh, you know, and I think that being able to say, oh, yes, we do want to take on pandemic preparedness and we would need this to do it effectively. And we've thought about this and this was done last time um, that wasn't more effective, but we can do it this way that is, we, we think more effective, um, you know, and it's, the agency's been through a tough couple of years. I was lucky to have, you know, it's fascinating that um, uh, of all the agency heads that um, President Trump assigned uh, and appointed who really fundamentally opposed the mission of the agencies that they were uh, appointed to lead, the one who really supported what his agency was trying to do was running the foreign aid agency, which I don't think many of us would have predicted headed into a Trump administration. Um, but, you know, the uh, I think the challenge for Samantha is to um, make sure that kind of morale is there and staff, uh, you know, that there's been a lot of turnover and uh, it's, it's been bleeding for a couple of years, you know, and we saw this after the, the battles of the 1990s, um, that there were lots of good folks who'd been squeezed out um, as the agency was fighting for its life. And then the agency was very poorly positioned um, headed into the world after September 11th, where suddenly it had extraordinary new demands placed on it. Um, and I fear that we're seeing, seeing a little bit of that repeated now. Um, you know, and I also think that um, looking at Samantha, who I've got, who's a friend, I've got tremendous respect for, you know, I think that uh, as I look at the the history of successful administrators. Uh, I think that you know, some of the best ones have really relied on senior career staff uh, and given them important roles and important voices. Uh, you know, and it's obviously you wanna bring in your own political people and need to do that, but making sure you strike the right balance of um, uh, uh, making sure that people are engaged in that process um, and giving them cover. Uh, I think that's the other thing is that, uh, I think that a lot of times in the interagency process, um, aid staff feel a little exposed that if things go sideways or pear-shaped that um, they're going to kind of pay the price for it. Um, you know, and I think creating a culture where senior management, senior leadership makes clear that um, uh, they have staffs back in those interagency discussions uh, and can actually deliver in somewhat real time. Because um, I think that's the other um, um, going back to what I said earlier, I think the kind of kudzu of regulations has made it much harder for the agency to deliver on interagency commitments in ways that um, its fellow agencies don't always understand. Um, and that is not a, necessarily an easy problem to fix. So um, I see Mark on the screen here. Thank you, John. Um, and that to me is a signal that at least the formal part of this discussion uh, needs to draw to an end. Um, Matt just asked Susan and Mark whether we might have, for those who want to stay on, another five or ten minutes or so for people that may want to ask more questions. 
Absolutely. Okay. That's uh, certainly a feature. It's our postlude. So we just want to respect people's time at the end. And it's, it's really been great to have you, John. Thank you so much for doing the book, which I can see is a real contribution and probably extremely timely. So we've uh, appreciated having you. Uh, and uh, love to have people stay on and continue just a conversation however they want. And uh, Mark, Mark's here in charge, can answer any questions that you may have if they come up on the admin side. But yes, you can continue. There's no. Okay. So thank you, Susan. Um, uh, John, uh, there was one or two questions still pending out sure. here. But, uh, and maybe we can get to them for those who want to stay a few more minutes. But I just want to say from bottom of my heart, and also as a board member of both of these organizations, ADST and the Alumni Association of USAID, thank you for your diligence on this and for those who helped you in that regard, including the editors of the, uh, those who were advising you from the publishers. Um, uh, but more, most importantly for affirming um, the uh, professionalism of US Foreign Service officers and civil service and other officers who've dedicated their lives and their careers and taken the risks to themselves and to their families um, of doing, uh, of helping with foreign assistance. And thanks for telling this uh, important story, a vital story, very well told. Well, so with that, um, we will close the uh, formal part of this, wait a few seconds and then see who else wants to stay on and I'll ask this other question that's hanging out here. Sure, I just wanted to add one thing. Thank you both for that insightful discussion. Uh, again, as it was mentioned, officially this, uh, this will be over. However, I do wanna remind folks that we will have a recording of this session available within the coming weeks on ADST's YouTube channel. So you're welcome to, uh, to tune in uh, once that video uh, gets uploaded. But again, as our tradition is, you're welcome to stay on and chat. Uh, and uh, continue the discussion. We, we love doing that and appreciate everyone joining us. Thanks.